to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hello there from Bedford. How are you all? Yes, I'm back home. I'm back in the global center of Bitcoin media. Back getting my shit together. Been away for a while. I've got so much to catch up on. Anyway, welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. I am your host, Peter McCormack, and today I have an interview with Tua Demista on the Bitcoin Reformation. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing show sponsors, and make sure you check them out. It's because of the sponsors I get to do all these great interviews. So first up, it is BlockFi. Yes, the amazing BlockFi. Yes, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. And with today's show, you will understand why companies such as BlockFi are so important to Bitcoin, bringing the layer of financial services to the space. And BlockFi are the best in the sector. They're building a powerhouse in Bitcoin for borrowing and lending, and they've done it without any bullshit token. So if you need a crypto loan for your cyber truck, you want to get a flamethrower, you want to take a trip to the moon, or because you've got to pay the man, BlockFi have got you covered. And if you want to earn interest on your Bitcoin, Ether or GUSD, well, they've dropped all minimum deposits and they have removed the early withdrawal penalty and you can receive interest in the currency of your choice. I am a customer and I do love getting my interest each month. I love that my Bitcoin is working for me. So if you're interested in checking them out, I recommend you do your own research. Then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. And next up, we have the mighty, mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. And let's be completely clear why Kraken is the best and consistently rated the number one exchange in the world. Firstly, they are the most secure exchange for trading Bitcoin. No filthy hacker is going to be getting to your Bitcoin. And if you didn't listen to my show with Nick Pococo, their chief security officer, please do go and check that out. It was an amazing show. And for you advanced traders out there, they have the best account management service you could ask for. And they also have an unrivaled suite of trading products. They've got Kraken.com, the best place to buy, sell and trade digital currencies. You crazy hardcore traders out there, they've got margin trading with up to 5x leverage. They've got futures and they've got indices. They've got the Kraken OTC desk for large trades with private and personalized services. They've also got Crypto Watch where you can trade on multiple exchanges from a single platform. And they've just released Kraken Pro, a beautiful mobile first app so you can trade on Kraken wherever you want. It doesn't matter if you're on the bus, if you're on a plane, if you're sat in the passenger seat of a car, if you're in Starbucks, if you're at the McDonald's drive through If you want to buy some more Bitcoin, you can do it on the go with Kraken Pro. You can find out more at Kraken.com or download the app, which is available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Okay, so on to my show with Tua Demista and my last interview with Tua, Bitcoin is in heavy accumulation, was a massive episode. I think it's like my fourth biggest episode. And so while I was out in Austin, I knew I had to get it back on the show. So Chua just released a new article called The Bitcoin Reformation, which drew parallels between the 16th century Protestant Reformation, where people challenged the power and authority of the Roman Catholic Church, which led to greater political and cultural freedom with Bitcoin in today's world. It's an amazing piece of writing. And I knew once I'd read it, we had to make a show about it. I reached out to Chua straight away. I said, look, when I'm over, let's make a show. And I was out there. I was out in Austin. So we recorded a show all about this. So we get into the article, the distrust in the banking and political systems, and if Bitcoin is the essence of rebellion. So I hope you like this one. I loved it. But you got any questions, you know you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Just a couple of notes. I'm back in bed for now. Got to get up to speed on a few things. I've been away for so long. So much to catch up on. But next week, I'm going to be heading out to Uruguay for Le Bitconf. Probably going to be going via Buenos Aires and hopefully heading out to Bolivia for a couple of days for my other show, Defiance. So hopefully I will get to hang out with a few of you there. Anyway, if you've got any questions about the show, do reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. So I want to move out here. and What? Uh, yeah, to well, Austin wanna, or well, where? Well, to the States. US, yeah, yeah. I want to move to the States. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'd originally always wanted LA because... I like it in LA, but I don't think it's great for the kids. And then I thought New York's better for work, especially, I don't know if you know, I've got a second show now called Defiance. Well, I know you're killing it with the Bitcoin show. Well, that's going well, but I've got this other show, Defiance. And mm. that's, so in New York, there's an interview you can do every day. But yeah, again, I'm yeah, like, yeah. do I want to live here and with my kids? Mm. Uh, but I'm now actually thinking about Austin. Well, so consider, consider that 75% of the Texas population lives in the Texas Triangle which is within a three-hour drive of here. So that's like 20 million people. So if you look at it that way, it's kind of, you're in a 
in a metro area, it's it's a really like lots of people live here. Well, what I've got to think of is mm. like you know I like to do my interviews in person. Yeah, we've only done one remote. This is is this your fourth one? Third, one oh. remote and one live in 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 um, San Francisco. Yes, your third one then. But I prefer them in person. So actually, interestingly, the one we did remotely is my third biggest show. The uh, oh, wow. Bitcoin yeah, and Heavy yeah, Accumulation, yeah. that one blew up. But, you know, I prefer them in person. But well, the way it works now is if I'm based in the UK, I come out for two, you know, I'm going to be here for two and a half weeks. I'm going to record 30 interviews over those two weeks, which is grueling. But then yeah. I'm set up for a month. Yeah. And my kids stay with their mum. But if I come out here, my son will come with me. It's just kind of like... All right, I can interview you, and I can interview Bitstein and Jimmy, and like there's there's maybe ten people here. Yeah, not very many. But th- am I still gonna have to travel? Can I get people to come in? Will I end up doing more remote? But in the end, it's kind of like some places I could go in and out of in a day, but lifestyle wise, it feels like Austin's the place to be. I think so. Yeah, I love Austin. I think it's it's. I mean, first of all, it's growing so fast. There's this also. There's this kind of really entrepreneurial culture here and it's 100 and what is it now 150 years ago there were 40,000 people in the entire state of Texas so like pretty much everyone is was an immigrant at some point coming in here uh, and you can really feel that there's really kind of this you know people they have the guts to think big and they're just building a lot of cool stuff and it's and it's diversified as well like if you look at all the different industries that are present in Texas and then, you know, here in Austin, there's UT, UT Austin, the, the university. No, um, no state tax. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing that's drawing me in. But the other thing is also, I feel like Austin has become, like, there's no real home of Bitcoin. Like, it's everywhere. But I feel like there's a real density building yeah. around here. Like, a yeah. real density of Bitcoiners. I mean, not that influencers are everything, but I had a look at the, what is it now, the Hive.1 top 100 Bitcoin influencers. Yeah. And uh, to my knowledge, six of them now live in Austin, and that's doubled wow. that of two years ago. Where, where are you on that list, though? You're like top 10, aren't you? Uh, yeah, somewhere in there. I mean, Shut it depends on where you what are. list. There's, there's so many lists. But uh, I like Hive.1 because it's kind of, it, it's based on who follows each other. And so it's like the Google page yeah. rank idea. And so if, if some other influencers follow you, then you go up in the ranking. So I, I do like that approach. I dread the email every week because I'm like, the email every because I'm a bit of a lunatic and a bit confrontational. Uh, every week, the the email that comes in that tells you who's followed you new and who's unfollowed you, it's always like, "Fuck, who have I pissed off this week?" And I, <laughs> I kind of like sometimes I just delete it because I don't want to know. Yeah, and then yeah, sometimes yeah. I open it with a squint and I'm like, "Oh shit, I've pissed off this person this week. They've unfollowed me." Like I've had some, I've had some yeah you know, brutal unfollows. But have like, you ever like repaired ties, like somebody who blocked you that you then like? Yeah, I've interviewed, I think on three occasions now, I've interviewed people who I'm blocked by. Oh, that's awesome. So Eric yeah, yeah. Voorhees, the first time I interviewed him, I was blocked by him. And I didn't know why, and he didn't know why. And we did the interview, and I said to him, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm blocked. And he's like, really? And I, I was like, yeah, I don't know why. So I, we went and searched Twitter, and it was back, I was very, very new. And it was during S2X, and I just said something outrageous. Mm-hmm. Like it was, And I was really outraged. I apologized, and he unblocked me, and... I consider us friends, friends in the world of you know, Bitcoin. If I want to do an interview, he'll, yeah, he'll yeah. do it. But there, there's a few more. I, I've blocked a bunch of people as well. And like, but I, I'm the kind of person who will block and have people block me. You're not because you're, you're not a confrontational person. Yeah, I, 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 my block list is probably runs in the hundreds now, but I've been on Twitter for 10 years. So you wow. kind of just, I, I'm pretty quick to block. But then if people ask like, hey, you know, a friend of mine, he's blocked. Like, would you mind unblocking? I, I usually just go ahead and do it. I've done a mass unblock at once. And that was a terrible idea. I did it and said, look, let's start afresh, blah, blah, blah. Same people, straight in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're a moron. You're an idiot. So uh, anyway, look. Great to get you back on. Always great to get you back on. I know it's good for downloads. So it's always great to get you back on. Uh, that last show did really well. Like I say, it's my third biggest show. And the, the two shows are bigger was on like an Andreas one that blew up. And like a very old one. But it did really well. People loved that show. And you were right. I mean, straight after that, Bitcoin went up to like 14K. You know, you got it right. How do you see it all now? Are we in like another accumulation period? Yeah, so back then the report was called Bitcoin and Heavy Accumulation. So the idea was like the, the long-term holders are just holding on. And meanwhile, we have this new, a new generation of investors who's piling in. And that, that's what I meant, like heavy, like really there was significant buying coming in. And now I think we've 
you know, the market got ahead of itself. People thought like, oh, this is easy. Like, this is like, you know, 2017 again. Let's just jump on board and go for another ride. And then, yeah, of course, we did go to 14. But I think I think it's just it was a bit too much too fast. And so this period now, there's a there's a famous analyst called Wyckoff. And so he has this model of yeah, how, how markets develop. And so he talks about accumulation, which is at the bottom. But then the next the next phase is reaccumulation. So you get a rally, and then the market needs a breather. They need to catch his breath, and and it kind of needs to shake off some more weak hands until finally you can go higher. Because that's how you go higher. If 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 all the weak hands are gone, then there's nobody really left to sell the asset, and then it just has to go up. So I think this is the phase now where you know from that point where we went to fourteen. All the way until now is all part of the reaccumulation. Like we're way above the bottom of three thousand, mm. and I I don't think we're going back there. No. I think you know if anything, you know maybe like a five thousand we could touch that briefly. But but in hindsight, I think it's all going to be part of this just wide band that we're trading in a range, and it's this is all a setup to just go to, into new all time highs again. But it's it's going to take some time. Yeah, I've seen some of the people, the doomers, saying, "Oh, we're going to go back to three k." And I was like, I, I don't see it. But do you know, what? if we went to five, even at five, we're like we're up on the year. You know, we're up from the three. You know, if it's a new, as long as because my time horizons changed too. My my time horizon now is like multi year, possibly multi decade. Like I don't sell Bitcoin ever anymore, and so I kind of I've got. I'm not emotional about the price moves anymore because as long as new bases keep establishing themselves, I feel quite comfortable. Right. Well, and that's also the secret of having appropriate size, right? If if you if you're not reliant on Bitcoin for for your income, for example, then you can be a lot more <laughs> relaxed about it. Yeah. Or if it's not your pension right away, then you can be more relaxed about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's. But it, it. I was thinking like just you know the past week i was like man this market it's been 10 years but it's still so volatile yeah like we went you know we went from 9000 to now seven and a half in what a month again mm-hmm. like you know so you would and it's it's not totally peanuts anymore like it's a 150 billion dollar asset so it definitely is scary and i think part of the volatility is just that people are still have trouble wrapping their head around like how do I know of the and it's binary like either you believe it's going to a million or you believe it's going to die like you can't really say oh it's just you know in 20 years from now it'll still be bubbling at around $5,000 <laughs> like you can't say that it's not going to happen all right well listen we're here to talk about your latest piece of writing the bit so interestingly i keep reading it as the bitcoin reformation but i also when i originally read it i saw the Bitcoin reformation. <laughs> so like, I was like, is it the reformation? Is that like a term or is it the reformation? Like, what is it? Well, honestly, you kind of, you catch me, uh, like I, I read a lot in English, but sometimes I honestly don't know yeah. what is the, I, I guess it would be reformation in the sense that it's really a well-established way to describe this historic period I didn't mean it literally. I didn't mean yeah. like Bitcoin is is going to be reformed. Although I mean originally that's that's what that was. The 16th century is when a lot of very old institutions radically got reformed. And um, I think it's your best piece of writing, by the way. Yeah, I think, I th- this I think is my so favorite thing you've done. I think it's the best I've done, especially in terms of tying together stuff that I'm passionate about. Because with you know, there's only so much you can do with price analysis, and 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 I, I. You know, it's always a bit sad if I put a lot of effort into a piece of writing that I know is going to stop being relevant two years down the road. Like, you know, Bitcoin and heavy accumulation, that's kind of gone now. Yeah. Of course, I can kind of like wave it around. But five years from now, nobody's going to remember maybe. This so so it's nice to, to put something together that I think hope is going to be relevant 10 or 20 years from now still. Yeah. I mean, like if you're right, people will refer back to this. Mm. But it's a proper essay. And my assumption is that a good good deal of work went into this. I'd love to ask how many times you edited it and reviewed it, because I'm imagining a few times. But I read it for a second time this morning, just in prep. Uh, I think it's fantastic. How long did it take you? Well, it's hard to tell, because like part of the process was just... I was kind of like, I thought I was taking a break from Bitcoin. I was just doing reading. And, and I, I've been always been fascinated by the differences in culture between Flanders, where I grew up, and Holland, in the Netherlands, because they, there's the same language. But if you cross the border, you see everything changes. Like, you know, the, the houses are different. The people, 
the culture is different. And there is some research actually that confirms that the the difference, the cultural difference between Flanders and Holland, that gap is the widest of any community that shares the same language and border pretty much anywhere in the world. And so then I was like, kind of like, I've always wanted to know, like, why is that? We're so close. So I started reading about the history and then gradually it just became clear to me like, oh, oh, oh. So what happened, I think the short of it is that the Rhine River is one of these major arteries in Europe. It, it starts in Switzerland and then it goes all the way to, you know, the Antwerp and, and mm-hmm. the Netherlands now. That's where it ends. And so historically in the Middle Ages, it was this amazing trading route, right? And so a lot of wealth and people moved always. And so it's almost, it's almost natural. It was almost like it had to happen that some some bubble of prosperity had to develop at at the end of that river, right? And so that's what happened slowly in the 15th century Bruges, which is where I grew up, became very prosperous. And then um, Antwerp in the 16th century, all of those are very close to the the end of the, how do you call it? The, the mound? Maybe that's what it mm. is? Where, where the river goes into the ocean. Oh, the mouth. The mouth, the mouth yeah. of the river. So that was kind of inevitable. And, and then with that, there was this constant flux of you know, new immigrants coming in. Like if you wanted to go to England, if you wanted to go to go elsewhere, you kind of had to go to the coast. Say that you're from France somewhere and you wanted to, you know, then, then you often would take the Rhine River to get there. So there was this kind of melt, natural melting pot environment. And, and, and that's why, like in the 15th century in Bruges, there was there was a Medici branch, like the, the, the Italian bankers, they decided to, to have a branch in, in, um, in Bruges and then in London. And so it was one of the major trading hubs. And so with that, it became like a, a place where radical ideas really found a friendly audience. Mm-hmm. And so gradually people who were critical of the church and they're like, hey, like, what is this? Like, we have to pay these um, these enormous fees to make sure that we get into heaven. Like, what's that all about? Like, and 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 kind of not being anti-theistic. Like, you're not anti-religious, but you're saying that you know the way this institution is handling it is not is not kosher. And so, anyway, I guess the short of it is what I discovered is that there was this this growing uh, rebellion in, 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 and the heart of the Netherlands at the time, because it was just one nation, like there wasn't really a, a separation much. It was really the, the more on the Flanders side. If you looked at the, the amount of people that lived in what is now the Netherlands was, was maybe uh, only a quarter of what, what, what lived, people that lived in, in what is now Belgium. And the reason is that there was so many floods. Like the, the, it's all below sea level, and so you, you can't really build a big city. And they hadn't figured out how to build these dikes yet. So, so there was this prosperity and rebellion. And basically the Spanish, they had this, the largest empire on earth because they had, they had uh, discovered the new world. They were like really mining, almost literally mining all the people there, the c- colonialism and getting lots of precious metals. And, and also they had this kind of vision of grandeur. Like they, they were God ordained by God to rule Europe. And so they really were very expansionist and they started pushing to conquer the Netherlands and what happened is that they only got as far as Antwerp. So they basically were able to dominate and, and suppress whoever was in Flanders, but they never were able to conquer what is now the Netherlands. Right. Okay. And I think that really was had a massive impact on the culture. Where like the you know, the intellectuals and and the merchants who had something to lose, they just moved up to Antwerp uh, to, to Amsterdam. And kind of who was left behind was um, beca- it became an impoverished area. If you look at the wages, for example, in the 17th century, were 30 percent lower in Flanders versus Holland, just because the Spanish were there. They were, you know, levying taxes. There was censorship. So that, to me, has like a, I just have a lot of personal kind of attachment to this whole story because I feel like, oh, finally, I'm getting some answers as to why are people so different in in, in Flanders versus Holland. What's going on here? So one of the interesting things about when I was reading it this morning, which I didn't notice the first time I read it, and perhaps it's because I wasn't reading it in prep for an interview. I just, yeah, I think as Meltem shared it, and I read it. I was like, oh, that was cool. And I kind of skim read it because it was like a yeah long piece. I actually sat this time and read it again for a second time, and the way I looked at it, it was quite a, like away from the parallels of history, just in terms of Bitcoin itself. It's I kind of feel like if we look at the debates around Bitcoin at the moment. They're almost like, if you're looking at it through the, the lens of a camera, 
people are discussing price and are people spending it quite you know, quite basic rudimentary things. It's almost like you've looked at it with this wide lens. You're seeing the wider changes in culture and society, and you're seeing how Bitcoin is relevant and can impact that. And then you've drawn the parallels to history. So I kind of saw it this like tour as this, we're all seeing the world of Bitcoin in this very small lens, and you're all looking through the wide lens. Well, I mean, that whole, we'll see if I'm right, but that, that's what I've always attempted with Bitcoin is like that, this just is so different. It's so different from anything that I had ever seen before. And so how can I better understand it? And so I've always looked for like, you know, are there any analogies that make sense? And so early on, a lot of people suggested like, oh, it's like the early days of the internet. And I, I do think that makes sense. And then, you know, there's like, I did an exercise where I looked at the, the, the nascent petroleum industry in the U.S. in the 19th century. And, but all those, and I've, I've, I've did several more of those exercises, but they always seemed a little too small to really convey what what the meaning of all this could be and so and I feel like I, I I was just luckily I stumbled upon this where it's just like especially the the uh, the the notion that technology is an accelerant for forces that are already there especially if you then also have a defensive component to your technology where you know what were in in the Netherlands of, of the 17th century that was water like people people started becoming they started controlling this force of water of course they were building ships but then also first they would build dikes around certain areas where they had their their farms and their lands but then if you have dikes that means you can control it you can basically break the dike and let a whole area flood and they use that strategically to uh, fend off this i mean it's just this amazing story if you think of it like there's this small bunch of rebels who fended off the largest empire in the world for 80 years, right? That's how long the 80 years war lasted. It, it's almost unprecedented. And the reason why they could do it is that, yes, they were prosperous, and yes, they had all kinds of innovative technologies, but they had in their favor this incredibly defensive force of, of water. Like, you know, they, they had a giant fleet. They could, they could go to England if they wanted to as a refuge. And the Spanish were just not, you know, they, would, the, they didn't bring their armada over they didn't build harbors the spanish had a, an army that walked across land all the way to holland and you know a lot of these soldiers just died in the mud right they were just you know they were flooded away and and so yeah so so the the comparison with today is like well wait a minute today we have cryptography which is this incredibly powerful technology that allows people to defend themselves because i think that you know the 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 battlefield, so to speak, is is virtual now, or right? it's yeah. a digital, it's a digital um, struggle, right? And the question is, like, how do we, you know, it's one thing to have all this fun innovation of like, ooh, like, yeah, Bitcoin, or we do our own currency, or this and that, but, but what if the going gets tough? Like, what if we really get get traction with this and governments don't like it? Well, then there has to be a defensive component, and I do think that's there, and that's cryptography in general. Well, so I'm, I've got the quote here. So let's go back a step. The reason it's relevant is because you identified a number of things. So you identified the fact that it's Bitcoin encryption, the internet millennials, right? You identified them and the millennials do not trust the institutions. And I'm guessing the millennials don't trust the institutions because, well, a number of reasons. You know, we've had a lot of bad press. We've had bad governments, we've had poor monetary policy, you know, we have millennials who are taking college degrees and struggling to get jobs, right. and then also struggling to get on the housing ladder, and they'll, you know, the, the, this kind of hatred that's come towards the, the boomers, right? But you, you identified that millennials don't trust the financial institutions. So I'll take the quote, because it was really, that's why I wrote it down. You've got, in the 21st century, the defensive technology, technological suite available for people who question the economic status quo is cryptography, which can enable privacy and protection from asset seizure. I th I, in some ways, privacy is more important because it's more relevant to you because I've never suffered asset seizure beyond the libertarian view that all tax is theft, right? So obviously, via tax, I have asset seizure by some people's. Are you referring here more towards asset seizure whereby in times of economic crisis, they literally pill for the bank accounts like what happened in Greece and Cyprus? Yeah, that's one example. And then also if you look at, you know, the the, the Protestant Reformation, for example, what happened with the, 
the the Jews and the Protestants in Spain, for example, they were given a, an ultimatum. It was basically like, you know, either you get, uh, I think it was like either three or five years. I think they were given like three years time to leave and they had to pay an exit tax. And so not only did you have to leave, but then you also had to pay like 30% of all your assets. You just had to, you know, give. And then of course, back then it was, you know, how do you even trust some guy across the border to keep your asset, you know, to keep your money for you? And then, of course, if you walk away from if if, if all the all the wealthy people of a certain area are forced to do the same thing, well, how much how much money are you going to get for your farm that you're abandoning? Probably not very much. So, in a way, your your farm is then also seized. And so, yeah, if I think about the future, it's just like having some way that 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 reduces the cost of mobility is important and that that means not only like cheap airline tickets but it's especially if you want to take your capital with you how do you do that cheaply and i think you know encryption bitcoin things like that is is i think it's basically the new offshore banking well if you forget volatility because that's it is still kind of like the scary component yeah you know if, if the day you wanted to leave your country and move abroad and take your assets with you and put it in bitcoin and it was at 14k and then three weeks later it's dropped to 9k that is kind of terrible right it's some it, you know that is but let's forget that component for now let's just imagine we have you can ours. even subvert it right you can sell if you have it in gold you can sell your gold for bitcoin and then once you're established in your country of destination you rebuy the gold but even that journey and that process of reestablishing yeah. yourself you still have the some risk of volatility exposure. yeah but that you know that might be the yeah. the risk worth taking and it can work the other way you could get there and we could have a rally and you'd be rich but uh but but it's more the the idea that you have that tool now that you didn't have before. But I don't think it's just millennials. I I think it expands beyond millennials. I think there's plenty of people who feel disenfranchised with the current economic system and the economic status quo. I think there's a lot of people, you know, I certainly know from the UK, we're like we're in the midst of an election and we have a conservative uh, center and some some policies center leaning, some points very far right leaning conservative party coming up now against a very left-wing like almost extreme left-wing labor party now and there are a lot of people disappointed with the economic mm -hmm. status quo so whilst i identify and agree with the millennials i think it expands a bit beyond that yeah i mean the reason why i've gone back and forth like should i pick the millennials like you know i could also just have said oh the bitcoiners right yeah they're going to be the ones and it is if you if you extrapolate right if you if you project that Bitcoin is going to be a million dollars and you look at how many people, you know, today own how many Bitcoin, roughly speaking, it's not crazy to say that in 20 years from now, 30 to 50 percent of um, I need to look up the, the exact calculation I did. But I think it's I think it was around at least 30 percent, 30 percent of the world's billionaires 20 years from now could be Bitcoiners. So that's basically a pretty radical shift. But then again, if you think about it. Already 50% of today's billionaires have made their money through investing in technology. So, so that's also kind of already a generational shift because the younger people were just more ready to, to invest that in, in an early stage. And that's kind of where I'm thinking, like, you know, why does it make sense to pick millennials? They've, um, to some extent, their trust in the status quo has been shaken. Like, uh, by definition, uh, the millennial generation, they were consciously aware of uh, the 9-11 attacks, mm -hmm. which, you know, I, I don't mean it from a conspiracy angle, but just kind of like, you know, th there's kind of a shift in terms of like, well, things that we took for granted, like, is everything so safe anymore? Or, and then, of course, they're very aware. And as a young adult, they the 2008 crisis. And, and, and so, of course, a lot of other people saw that too, the older generations, but... I think especially the millennials are are kind of digital native. So so they, you know, they grew up like I grew up streaming BitTorrent movies from my dorm room, right? Uh, my parents never were able to. They're like the cassette and radio generation. Um, and so I, I, I would think, throw another one in there. Yeah, yeah. A more recent example. I think it's it's a bit <laughs> it's a bit of a segue, but I think the Epstein mm. situation has created a bigger distrust in the system that there is potentially a deep state at work. And I think that has thrown another spanner in the works where people like, because that was so, something that seemed so obvious under our nose is that either it was somebody allowed to kill themselves who shouldn't, he should have been monitored, you know, or somebody killed him. Right. <laughs> but that, that's another thing that I think, for, certainly for me, threw in another distrust of the system. Right. Well, and also, even before that, if you think about like, well, you know, like how did he die and things like that, but it's also kind of like, 
how much rot is there that we weren't aware of previously? Like we had the church scandals, mm -hmm. but the church is kind of economically speaking is like way down the ranks. And, and we had church scandals starting from the late 90s, like these pedophilia scandals. But now it seems like we're moving up where it's like, oh my God, like is, is the rot everywhere? Like yeah. I, so I agree. I do think that that kind of contributes to this notion that don't trust everything that you've been told, right? Maybe there's people that, that, you know, kind of like the priests. Like priests are a good example because they always, you know, they, they, they talk a good deal about ethics and, and, and this and that. And so if a person like that is then credibly accused of abuse, then that, that really kind of shakes your trust in that whole affair of or what they're about. Yeah. Well, it puts us in that mm. position now where I think people are questioning money a bit more. Mm. I just think it wasn't something – I was talking about yeah, this with yeah, uh, yeah. Bitstein. It's like I wasn't taught it at school. I only became aware – of thinking about money, yep. like to the extent where I consider it the way I sit, consider a Bitcoin and like is value now, is future value, the consideration for inflation, etc. Like two years ago, two, yep. I'm 30, I'm 41 now, so yep. at 39 I started considering this, maybe right. 38. You know, I think a lot more people are thinking about money now, thinking about, whoa, you know, how does this work? Are we going to just continually get fucked by the system? Right, right. Well, and, and that's my point in the Bitcoin Reformation Report is that people in the 16th century went through a similar process where all of a sudden there was this crazy guy in Germany who, who had this pamphlet, the 95 Theses, and he was questioning the Catholic Church. And, and because of the printing press, you could produce books and pamphlets at an extremely low cost, like the price of books dropped from a year's wage to the price of a chicken over a century. And so because of that technological progress, all of a sudden this... I, these ideas of this one fringe person in Germany were spread on thousands and thousands of copies across Europe. And he was saying, I mean, this guy was was making fun of the Pope. Like he was genuinely engaging in extreme satire and things like that. And so, yeah, all of a sudden, whether you agreed or disagreed with him, all of a sudden people were talking about the legitimacy of the Catholic Church. And so I think similarly... Even, of course, Satoshi is nowhere near as, uh, I'm not saying at all that he's like a Martin Luther. He's nowhere near as political and, and blasphemous and whatever, but just kind of like by suggesting, like letting this little balloon float that, oh, maybe we can have our own digital currency that's private. All of a sudden, everybody's questioning the legitimacy of these central banks. Like, do we even need you? And then there's this reaction from them where they're like, well, we're going to do our own digital currency. And we don't really know what it's going to look like. We don't even know if it makes sense. But, you know. Well, and that's, digital currencies are the big thing, man. And that's the counter-reformation, which is exactly what the Catholic Church did back then. They had a response and they because they kind of want to prove their relevance. And you kind of see them, you know, you kind of hear their head crack about like, oh, trying to come up with something to show that they're still relevant and important and that their monopoly is justified. And I think that's... That's how I see, you know, China being friendly towards blockchain and like all these like Libra and these private, you know, private currency initiatives. It's like, you know, that similarly in the, in the, in the Protestant Reformation, there were all these all of a sudden, yes, there was Luther, the radical Lutheranism, but there were a lot of like, you know, Catholicism light where like all of a sudden you had these like kind of softer spinoffs. So it's it's kind of amusing to to take a step back and imagine like, oh, wow, this is really kind of a societal shift like this giant iceberg might be like turning upside down slowly so yeah i i agree like i mean all of a sudden people are it's like it's not even we're allowed to question money all of a sudden but it's like now it's conceivable like oh yeah there's this counter example of of bitcoin and so uh all of a sudden we have something real to talk about i'm going to tell you now what my favorite part of the mm. whole article was the one intuitive parallel, the very essence of rebellion. That was the thing where I was like, because I read it and I was like, I love this. And I, I got to that, but I was like, ah, oh, now I, this is more, this is like a movement. This is like something I want to be part of. Like when the history books are written and if <laughs> if Bitcoin does change society in like in a better way, if it does improve money, if it does fix things, as Michael Goldstein would say, it's like, I want to be on the right side of this. You know, I want to, I want to be on the side of the rebellion and, and then when you tell me, like, Bitcoin is a rebellion, I'm like, fuck, I really want to be part of this. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say to each his own. Uh, what I was after mainly is is I didn't mean it as like a rallying cry, but mainly to be like, you know, what, what 
at least to give people a framework that allows them to better make a choice or a decision. Um, was it like the um, the battle cries? Is that what you mean? Were yeah, the... well, so you listed the three things under I mean, I'm taking parts out, but you're like, it's the very essence of rebellion. Don't trust Verify. Mm. Hot or not mm. your keys, not your Bitcoin. It's the things that go with it. It's almost like Bitcoin is the rebellion, but like these are the rallying cries, yeah. a part of it. And yeah. I, yeah, I love that. Yeah, and, I, I th- yeah, and, 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 and so because to me, the, the it kind of maybe it looks a bit frivolous to see it. Like, is that not, is that really part of the research to like look at these memes and stuff like that? But you have to remember that the, the Protestant reformation was, was a populist movement. It was a popular movement. And like a lot of people who they weren't theologians and, you know, it was really kind of carried by the people. And so it makes sense that in a way, this complex movement was summarized in very pithy statements. And so at the time it was like, for example, sola fide, it meant like, and, and also sola scriptura. So sola fide meant you don't need a priest to get into heaven. Faith alone is enough, right? God, God can see beyond the priest. He can like stare right into your brain. And so if, as long as you're pure on the inside and you're faithful, you're going to get to heaven. So, so that it's like a way to say, you don't have to trust a middleman. You can just talk straight to God. Like only faith is enough. And the other one was sola scriptura, which meant only scripture. So like all these theological interpretations, and they were making fun at the time of scholastics who had these, you know, uh, complicated interpretations of the Bible and trying to marry it with Aristotle. They said like, which I don't think it was a great thing, but it just happened. They said to hell with all that. We're going to translate the Bible into German, into Dutch, into English, and then you can engage with the word of God directly. Like, so, so you don't need the, the middleman, mm-hmm. this monopolist provider of religious services, which was the Catholic Church. And so that's where I see the parallel today. All these like slogans in Bitcoin that is like, you know, Vires in numeris. It's like, you know, faith in numbers. We don't trust the bank. You don't need to trust the bank. We put our faith, like the Winklevoss say, we put our faith in a system of mathematics. Yeah. Or like, don't trust verify. Exactly. It's what it says. Like, don't trust the middleman, run your own full node, and you are empowered. And so that's that kind of spirit is, I feel very strongly, is, is parallel to what happened back then. Next up, I talk to two more about the Bitcoin reformation. But before that, I have a message from my amazing sponsors. So first up, Wire. And thank you to everyone who's taking the time to check them out. This is the final month of their sponsorship. So if you've not checked them out yet, please make sure you do. I want to make sure they get the most out of the sponsorship. So Wire, they're helping companies across the space offer Bitcoin onboarding. It doesn't matter whether you are a solo developer or a large team. If you are looking to simplify user onboarding and offer your users a fast and easy way to purchase Bitcoin, then you need to talk to Wire. They have been crushing it since 2013 and are focused on taking care of the heavy lifting in terms of compliance, payments and liquidity so you can focus on building your core offering. Your idea could be the next killer app, so don't let the regulators kill it. To find out more, reach out to Wire or create a developer account at sendwire.com, which is S-E-N-D-W-Y-R-E dot com. And lastly this week... We have Dropbit, the best mobile wallet in the business, and Dropbit have absolutely killed it this year. They have crushed 2019. Can't wait to see what they're going to do next year. Well, I know a little bit about what they're going to do next year, and I can't wait to tell you all about it. But have you downloaded the app yet? I know thousands and thousands of you have so far, which is utterly amazing. So thank you so much. And what a year, though. So many good things. So when I started working with them, you could text Bitcoin to people. But now you can tweet Bitcoin to people. They've added Lightning support. They've got Betch32 address support. They even allow for onboarding within the app. They've done so much stuff this year. They've absolutely killed it. Seriously, if you've not checked out Dropbit, then what are you doing with your life? Definitely go and download the app. And if you want me to unlock your Lightning wallet, just reach out to me on Twitter. I will get through all of them. I will send you some sats. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. All right, now I'm going to pick out the thing that was the surprise to me, <clears throat> right? The part of it that was a surprise. Because I want to get to the, like, I want to get to the practical parts of this, like the reality. Actually, I just want to get to the conclusions because that's that's the really interesting part. There's the way you, it's almost like your predictions that I think super interesting. But the one thing that stood out to me and I didn't see coming was the part on IEOs. Mm-hmm. Do you see that as IEOs on Bitcoin or do you still see the continuation of altcoins? 
So an IEO is initial exchange yeah. offering. Uh, it's basically an exchange that issues a token to help them finance something. Usually they have some kind of trouble and they need to raise more cash as a buffer or for whatever reason, maybe they want to expand their services and they don't want to dilute their equity. They don't want to just sell shares in the mm -hmm. company. And so they're like, here's this token. And the way it works is almost like an annuity. It's like a, it's a, it's like a, a kind of a, a basic life insurance contract where you invest a lump sum and then the way an annuity works is that then you get a kind of a, a fixed income over time until the, the lender pays you back the initial investments. And so in theory, it could go on forever. But of course, you, you're not paid dividends on these IEOs. Well, what they do is they, they promise to, on a monthly basis or quarterly basis, go into the market, buy back a certain amount of tokens and burn them. Mm -hmm. And so therefore making the token more scarce and therefore transferring value to the investors. And so to me, that's, that's, that's a similar idea where you get to share in the profitability of the exchange. And the, and the parallel that I'm seeing there is that, and, and in a way it doesn't have anything to do with Bitcoin, right? It's just you're issuing a security and then they, these people, they, they get financial benefit from it. Uh, and it's 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 way more feasible to do that than to say we're going to just borrow Bitcoin from the public because of course you know who knows how high Bitcoin can go, mm -hmm. which is exactly how annuities work. Like the idea is that this this is why annuities were so popular in a deflationary world because straight out debt was dangerous, right? If if I owe you know whatever a hundred gold coins and there's gradual deflation, then then I can basically dig myself a hole that I can't get out of. Mm -hmm. But if I, I if I have an annuity contract where I get a fixed amount of money and then the the what I owe is is expressed as a percentage of my revenue, well then that's predictable, right? Mm -hmm. If 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 the grain prices go down or whatever, I still keep paying that same percentage of revenue. So that's kind of a model that works in a deflationary world. So so the parallel that I see is these annuities were very popular <coughs> And issued by villages in in Holland, especially who were besieged by the Spanish, they had to build up their dikes, they had to raise their walls, they had to build defenses, they had to sometimes hire mercenaries from 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 England, etc. Maybe some of your ancestors uh, helped us out. Who knows? Maybe. And and the investors, of course, sometimes one of these villages lost, and then you just you know you were wiped out. But over you know in the long run, it was actually a very profitable and and mutually beneficial agreement, and that's kind of where. I think there was some some argument to be made that these offshore exchanges, especially like Bitfinex, if anything, they're embattled, right? Whether you agree with you know how they run their business or not, they are kind of under threat by all kinds of authorities that have lots of things to deal with. So I think it makes economic sense for them to issue these tokens. And I don't see any I don't see any scenario where this would stop happening, right? It's it's just a clear win-win situation where there's historical precedent and of course there's people that want Bitfinex to keep running because maybe they built their business model on it etc cetera, etc cetera. just like back then the citizens who lived in those places were invested in you know the city not being sacked and mm. and their their houses being burned wow okay so you see this do you see it like you say ieos the, <laughs> like the proliferation but do you see this being used as a a tool by any kind of company sure yeah, I mean, why not? But um, I guess I would have to think about it more. It, it might not. I think it especially makes sense for a, a company that has a revenue stream that's substantial and at the same time is facing some existential risks mm -hmm. where all of a sudden, you know, there's the Spanish army. Oh, my God, they're only, you know, two weeks away. We need money now. Yeah. That's kind of, that's when you, you know, it, it, because it, it is a, a significant cost, right? To commit mm -hmm. to, you know, paying part of the revenue to these outside investors, you know, that, that can hurt. And so you'd only maybe do it if you're really under threat. Uh, I'm sure Bitfinex, if, if they had, you know, unlimited capital, they would maybe raise it in another way. If, if there were VCs, you know, up the wazoo, they would, but, but it's because they're so in battle that they kind of resort to this particular type of contract, I think. Right, so let's get into the conclusions. Right, I'm going to encourage everyone to read it because I th and I think they should read it before they listen to the interview. And if we had three hours, I would dive into a history lesson with you because it's just it is so fascinating. Mm. But the the conclusions are, are the practical. It's the practical output of this. But firstly, I like the fact you brought in the Eric Weinstein quote: "The uh, fit ideas beat unfit ideas," because it's very true. Bad ideas do win, mm -hmm. but fit ideas 
do be unfit ideas. I thought that was great, but I very much love the, the this pit you wrote. And again, I'm going to quote you, but. Meanwhile, the Bitcoin ecosystem is maturing in all aspects of its economy, in particular in deposit banking, insurance, lending and derivatives, and early forms of life insurance. If this process persists, Bitcoin's layer protocol suite could become a global powerhouse and potential alternative to the IMFS. Like, that was a really, like, powerful quote for me to read, because what it made me do is sit back and go, do you know what, I need to always stop thinking about price and look at the growth of the ecosystem, look at the growth of companies, look, I mean, look at the place we are now recording Mm -hmm. this. This kind of company, like Unchained, BlockFi, those kind of companies, like, there there is a real shadow financial system being built with Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but you, like, I think I think I'm going back to the point here of looking through the standard lens and then the wide lens. The standard lens, you can look at Bitcoin and go, the price is down, it's dying, or it's not being used for transactions. Whereas I see, Chu, you're you're looking at the wide lens and you're seeing the growth of the ecosystem right. and the build of the build up of services in Bitcoin that makes this a real shadow economic financial right. system. Yeah, right. it's almost like if, if you imagine, you know, 16th century Protestant merchants, just imagine that they're one company and that you can invest in them. How volatile would that have been, right, to invest mm. in that? Like, you know, all of a sudden there's this giant army, they're sending 100,000 soldiers a year, like, you know. But at the same time, you see that they're like, you know, the ships that they built are like, the best in the entire world. They finally cracked the technology that allows them to explore uncharted territories and make it back safely, which is you had to push navigational technology a little further to do that. And so that's a massive breakthrough. So in a way, if you looked at the fundamentals, you could tell where it was going to go. Like these guys were going to just kill it. And and they did. I mean, eventually that's this kind of what I'm so excited about too is part of one, one of the discoveries, at least for me, like all historians know this, but... New York City was founded by the Dutch, right? Incredibly. It was just a trading hub and and the idea of religious tolerance wasn't from kind of, it wasn't from some ideological zeal. It was just pragmatism. It was just like, you know, if we want to make this thing work, we're going to have to be tolerant. And so, you know, Jews are welcome and everybody's welcome. As long as you don't kill each other, you know, we're happy to have you. On the island of Manhattan, there was a an English, uh, no, a priest actually, who went there and he was horrified. He called it Babel because even though there were only 500 people living on the island of Manhattan, there were 18 different languages spoken. He, he thought it was just horrifying, right? Everybody should, of course, speak Latin, which is, you know, or whatever, or Greek or some kind of uh, divine language. And so, so, you know, if you could have bought an ETF backed by badass Protestant rebels, and uh, not just rebels, but really merchants, I would have gone long all day long. It would have been super volatile, but there was this amazing strength from it. For, and it was decentralized, right? They were mm-hmm. not, and that was part of the weakness of the Spanish, for example. Yes, they were a powerhouse, but it was very centralized and Spanish merchants suffered by it. They had to pay the high taxes. They There were all kinds of rules that made it hard for them that the Dutch did not did not have any problems with. And so to me, it's, yeah, I do try to look beyond the day-to-day volatility and, and kind of try to see the big picture. And when you're looking at the big picture, are there any key parts that you think are missing within the, the Bitcoin ecosystem? No, I think I think everything is being worked on. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, nothing's perfect. And so there's always areas where things can improve. We need we need better deposit insurance. You know, we need, we need uh, better deposit security like we need we need more robust multi-sig solutions that's kind of still early on but some very very promising things are in the pipeline i think that we probably need just more information like we need to be able to have more transparency of the exchanges and and better auditability of of institutions because bitcoin is highly auditable as a technology but it doesn't always translate to the the companies that are built on bitcoin i think we need also more clarity that like there's a lot of alchemy out there, which is like, you know, there's like <laughs> real science happening, but then there's also all these quacks that are saying, I've invented perpetual motion and time travel. And and I think that's, you know, a lot of the altcoins are kind of like that. But that gets sorted out with time. Like, it's just, we need time. Do you, do you see Bitcoin eventually destroying and taking out fiat money? Or do you see it as that it was something that will always sit alongside it? My best guess right now would be that 
it, it is going to be similar to how things evolved with, with religion where the Catholic Church never disappeared, right? As far as I know, there's still a billion Catholics around. But the, the, the political strength and clout and power of, of the Catholic Church has very significantly diminished in favor of much more secular ways of doing things. It's not like, oh, some other religion monopolized everything. It's like, no, religious tolerance, that's what happened. And so in, in translating that to Bitcoin, it would mean that it's not that the church of Bitcoin is going to take over the church of the Federal Reserve. It's more that there's going to be financial tolerance. That's, you know, who whatever, whatever country bets on financial tolerance is going to win, which means mm-hmm. that they allow for Bitcoin to be used as a money and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, well you yeah. said like bitcoin tolerance versus intolerance it will become a major political fault line yeah and it's quite interesting again when you saw that that actually made me think of the david marcus testimony in congress because i was like the paypal yeah cfo no coo well he was he yeah. was high up in paypal at yeah, some point so and now libra lead, yeah because there were clearly people with within congress who have understood Bitcoin very supportive, even though they know the implications for government and politics. And there were those who were clearly, maybe not scared, but intolerant, mm-hmm. maybe scared or maybe think it's stupid or worried about losing control. But you you got to see that over like a two five-hour sessions, whatever, or three-hour sessions over a two days. You actually got to see how politicians would think about this. Very, very polarizing. Yeah. I mean, really, it's like... People are, are so, and that, that's also, again, why I chose the millennials, because if anything, they're less invested. If you're like 55 years old and you've been in finance, you in a way, you almost by definition are very invested in all these relationships that have to do with that monopoly. So it's a lot harder to just flip sides and be like, oh, you know, I'm now really excited about, or like, or also even to have a mentality of live and let live, because maybe your banker friends are going to be kind of shunning you after that well i just had nelson on who's the otc guy from kraken who was an ex-wall street guy bear mm-hmm. stearns jpm morgan i think but he was saying look when you've got to like 50 55 and you know why are you going to risk your retirement which is five ten years away by recommending this new yeah. volatile crazy yeah. asset there's no point there's yeah. absolutely no point taking this risk you know stick with the status quo take your retirement go and live your life out but and, and I I had never even thought about it like that I was like why the fuck are these people not career risk yeah career exactly. risk oh, yeah. why are they not just introducing Bitcoin but that's why it's like almost potentially it's a generational shift yeah. Yeah. I mean I'm reminded of Thomas Kuhn with his um, you know the structure of scientific revolutions where he also says that and like a new paradigm is introduced into science by usually by some some young guys some rogue scientists and they propose it and then for a long time it's kind of ignored until an entire generation retires and then the new generation can finally kind of acknowledge the paradigm shift and and part of that is just career risk if you're 50 years old and you're going to endorse this radical new theory that put puts everything upside down maybe your colleagues are not going to like that so much so the, the next thing you, you put, which again is kind of funny because of where we're sat recording this, but you said Bitcoin's primary drivers will be saving, lending, and underwriting. Mm-hmm. Talk me through that. And by the way, can, can you talk through underwriting? Because I don't fully understand it myself. Well, I mean, the, the idea is that Bitcoin is, is, is on the way to become the ultimate reserve asset, mm-hmm. which means it's highly liquid. And it, it, it retains its value and it even grows in value over time, which is, that's the perfect, if you want to, if you want to invest in someone, you want to, you want to give them some money and, and you want them to put up some collateral, well, then I would say Bitcoin is almost the ideal collateral because it can be liquidated in a day, right? And so mm-hmm. you can get your money back. Even if this guy's business endeavor totally fails, it's backed by Bitcoin. Therefore, you can get your money back. So, so I think it's really on the way to become the ultimate collateral. And actually, in the report, I make this analogy with the VOC, which was the East India company. The, very, the world's first IPO happened in 1609 when they founded this VOC company. And, and so there were stock certificates. And these stock certificates were in this very big enterprise that was generating lots and lots of cash and that kept growing. And it became used as collateral for all kinds of activities in the Dutch economy. And it was, it was 
just that was responsible for dropping the interest rates by 30%, wow. right? Just because there was liquid collateral available, all of a sudden, if I lent you money, you could put up some VOC shares as collateral, and then I felt all of a sudden a lot more comfortable to lend you money. So there's a lot more capital available all of a sudden. And so that that's kind of what I wanted to point out is like that these very basic functions that sometimes we even ignore in, in the the fog of like smart contracts and all these like buzzwords from 2017, these very basic functions can actually be extremely powerful. Just, you know, using it as a collateral to underwrite all kinds of things. Could You could underwrite, insu- you can use it to underwrite insurance as well. Um, well, one of the inter- interesting things as well I've noticed, because I work with BlockFi, they're a sponsor, and I right. know the guys here Unchained very well. One of the interesting things is when you refer to saving and lending, they kind of tend to shift depending on whether we're in a bull or mar- uh, bear market. So in the bear market, the lending was quite big. You know, people wanted to borrow money because they, yeah. you know, because they needed access to cash. And as as we kind of came out of a bear market and, and the market started to grow, we the the saving because people people didn't want to give away their Bitcoin. So it's almost like it follows the ebb and flow of the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it's there, it, there was also some tax arbitrage there because like you know, you, you might not want to sell your Bitcoin at a certain date. You might not want to wait until date X, but then you need cash now. So, you know, this is kind of what what, what wealthy people always do is they, they, you know, that was always a mystery to me. Like, you know, if you're a billionaire, why do you have any debt? But like there's something, the strategic debt where yeah. you say, oh, well, let's incur some debt now and then we can defer our taxes to the next year or something like that. All right, so the next thing was interesting as well because you said collaborative custody to become an industry standard. And I just thought, Bank. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, there's, always gonna be, there's always going to be third party custodians. The question is, how are things organized and who do you have to trust? And so the, the, the Coinbase model is just, you know, you send your Bitcoin to Coinbase, they hold all the private keys, and, and that's it. And so if they, if they go bust or if they have kind of an internal, an internal problem where somebody gets access to those keys, you're, you're, you're done for. But the idea with collaborative custody is that you involve multiple parties so that the risk of collusion becomes smaller, especially if you think about multiple companies. Because, of course, like Coinbase, it's not like one guy holds all the keys. They do have internally some kind of system, but that's a black box. Like, we don't have access to that. We don't know exactly how that happens. Whereas if, if you as an individual can then can set up a multi-sig wallet solution where very specifically designated companies are responsible for parts of the process, then all of a sudden it becomes a lot more transparent. And then you can you can just come up with all kinds of smart contracts, really. I mean, I know people throw it around all the time, but, but this is actually a real smart contract that's useful where, for example, you can build in some kind of clawback idea where, or, or you can have an emergency button that you can push if something happens that you don't like and then the funds are are bumped to some address that you still control or or um, if you for example don't do anything with the key for a long time maybe automatically the control is reverted to you so the reason why I'm, I'm trying to emphasize this in the report is that it was based on what I saw happen with the Bank of Amsterdam, which was mm-hmm. the most reputable gold bank, the, the just full reserve bank in Europe at the time. And they had a very complicated security protocol. And it was so, so well regarded that people were willing to pay an AGO for uh, funds that were held at that bank, which basically meant one ounce of gold held at the bank you would be willing to pay more than one ounce of gold for that for that asset. So, and, and the reason was that it was very you know very secure. So yeah. you would pay for security, but also because then you could use it as collateral. There was there's basically services built on top of it. Um, you could build VO, you could buy VOC shares with it, things like that. And so so just kind of seeing that, for example, they had I think they had four separate. CFAs like kind of like who were looking at the books like they had four separate levels of of controls built in and so that kind of the idea was like we're under siege here we don't know who to trust we have like droves of new immigrants coming in we're very prosperous but like how do we do this right it's just like well you would divide the labor and so that's 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 the idea behind collaborative custody so I logically speaking there must be some significant appeal for that going forward. Yeah. Okay, you covered this. You talked about offshore banking may transform into Bitcoin banking. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, Obama said it. (laughs) Bitcoin is like a a bank in your pocket Yeah. or an offshore bank in your pocket. Um, No, I mean, if you look at traditional offshore banking, it's kind of under threat. And 
And it is because they are reliant on the IMFS, the International Monetary and Financial System. And so if they want to keep that connection, they have to abide by these international rules, which is, you know, is the equivalent of that, you know, what Rome says matters. It's like the Pope says X, Y, or Z. We're a Catholic country. I have to abide by it. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, so a Swiss bank is going to have to open up their database to some kind of, FBI, it doesn't matter if it's U.S. or another one, if that's what the rules say. And, and, and so I think that better privacy is available in, in, in the Bitcoin sphere and it will grow. And it just makes sense to me that gradually, and, and this is not w- without kind of, without even going into the moral question, because people, there is obviously lots of controversy about, about offshore banking, but I think it's clear that economically there's always going to be significant demand for moving funds offshore and, and the reason why you want to do that privately is well established. Like if you're, for example, a Brazilian entrepreneur, you know, you have the risk of asset seizure in your own country because there's not really a lot of rule of law. So so that's that's a reason to move your funds offshore. But then if um, your privacy is compromised and some database leaks that you have $10 million sitting in a Swiss bank, all of a sudden your family is a lot more at risk for, for example, kidnapping risk or things like that. So anyway, I... Again, I, I just want to say that I think it's it's here to stay, offshore banking. And right now, because of all these transparency and KYC rules, AML, KYC rules, it's kind of, if, if offshore banking becomes entirely transparent, well, that's kind of missing the point. Like That's part of the reason why it exists in the first place. So then, you know, entrepreneurial banks are going to venture into different territory, for example, Bitcoin. All right, we've got two left that I want to cover. Conscious of time. Okay, Bitcoin to mature quickly. Bonds, annuity, loans, and insurance. I didn't get insurance before, but you talked about that last time I spoke to you. You talked about insurance. Yeah, or like life insurance. Yeah. Even, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Bitcoin is just a natural asset to be used as the basis for a life insurance industry. Like, if you look internationally, life insurance has become less and less relevant and banking has grown more and more relevant, and in, in financial terms as well. In the 1930s, the life insurance industry was bigger in the U.S. than the banking industry in the U.S. Like that's how. If you if you walk around in Chicago and all these older cities, you see these buildings, and they say like mutual trust, this and that. Those were life insurance companies. Like you can still see it. And the reason why it it lost its its relevance in the economy is that a life insurance contract is expressed in the money. So if I have a million dollar life insurance contract, that's great if we live in a deflationary world, right? If the money sh- you know, increases in value, then I'm happy with a million dollars down the road. But if the money erodes in value and, and that million dollars could maybe only be enough to buy a bicycle 20 years down the road, then that's a lot less interesting. So, mm. so there's a lot of research that backs up that, that idea that – in an inflationary environment, life insurance is going to decline. And so, you know, because Bitcoin is so deflationary, my logical argument is, well, it could herald a new era of, of life insurance. And it's brilliant if you think of it. I mean, you can basically invest a little bit of money now mm-hmm. to kind of keep your family safe in case you, for some reason, stop be- being an income provider, right? Mm-hmm. If you die, then your family is at least taken care of. Um, so... I would love to see a resurgence of life insurance. Okay, we're going to finish on my favorite one. I actually texted this to Balaji this morning because I was like, it made me think of him as well. Yeah, so we covered the IOs. Is Bitcoin savers could accelerate a revolution in the history of thought? And I pondered on it for a while. I was like, well, hmm, what, what exactly are you getting? Because this doesn't fit with all the others. All the others are kind of part of monetary policy and economics. Right. But this is like almost like... Uh, what I t- let me tell you what I took from this and tell me if I'm I'm wrong, but this is almost like a, a shift in the way people think about money production consumerism. Well, I, you, you, I think you, it's well spotted that it, that it's different from the others, and I kind of snuck it in there. Yeah. Um, the very basic analysis that I'm suggesting is just that there's a new class, a new economic class, who has different values, different ideas, and who's going to have a lot of money. Yeah. And so they are basically able to sponsor whoever they want. And so and chances are that's not going to that's not going to 100% overlap w- whatever is the status quo today. I mean, we're already seeing it. A lot of millennials are kind of jaded thinking about universities. Like mm-hmm. I don't know if if 
you know, if, if Bitcoiners do become, you know, the new billionaires, if they're going to pour their, their wealth into, you know, Harvard endowments and things like that, right? So then it's like, well, where are they going to put their money? If it's charitable money and things like mm. that. So, and, and usually that, and, and so it's possible that we will see these new educational institutions that will, will you know, we'll see authors being sponsored to do certain things or, or um, radical. I mean, already to some extent, the dot com entrepreneurs, the dot com billionaires, they have sponsored things that are kind of fall outside of the status quo. Like, I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg has this idea of, you know, eradicating aging and they all these, you know, and then there's Jeff Bezos who's like, let's go to space and like they build stuff like that. It's just the billionaires. The billionaires usually want to do one of three things. They want to go to space. Mm. They never, they would never want to die. And they want to bunker in case World War Three kicks off. <laughs> but the, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, but that's not always been the case. There was a time when billionaires that they would, they would just build libraries, so mm. they were like you know, let's bring knowledge to the people, or, ah. or they would sponsor the church or things like that. So. Right. So your point was where the money gets directed. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I was I was thinking it more in just like this. This is a shift. This could cause a generational shift in the way we think about money and society. Yeah, like yeah. The world could change. Yeah. No. No. And so I think that's going to happen, but. So it goes to the Eric Weinstein's point is that mm. like, you know, well, yes, these radical and crazy ideas, they are around and these radical thinkers, but right now they're kind of scraping to get by, right? They're like the sophists, like they're kind of ignored. But if you have an entire economic class that is favorable to their ideas, all of a sudden they could gain a lot more prominence. And, and that's usually when the history books get written, if they're really, you know, like kind of like if you look at... Um, the city of Leiden, which is where a lot of the Protestants refugees went to in, in, in Holland. I mean, they started a university that became mm -hmm. like the intellectual heart of, of the Netherlands. And then they had a big impact, like all these thinkers there, they then kind of taught, you know, they were educating the youth. And, you know, that's kind of where the history of thought gets written in my mind. Well, listen, again, I'm going to say it, it's a really fantastic piece. It's without doubt my favorite. And I think I've read mm -hmm. everything you've written. I've certainly read everything on Medium, and I've read everything that you've published, I think. Wow, I'm uh, flattered. So well, I, well, I'm meant to if I've interviewed you. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I do. I love it. I, I, the, I have a feeling not as many people read this as much as Bitcoin is in heavy accumulation because – you know, that gets to the incentives, the accumulation. But I'm I'm gonna encourage everyone to read this before they I'm gonna just say just don't, if you haven't read it, don't fucking listen to this interview. But you've put the pressure on now for yourself because you know, your next scripture I expect to be of uh, <laughs> equally high. Maybe it needs standard. to be a book then, right? Maybe. Yeah. I think you've got a book in you, dude. I would say like this is the one to read with a glass of wine and like just kind of, you know and and, and it really was a labor of love. Like, you know, I really enjoyed diving into this and, and I love trying to like make it come to life. So I like included a lot of like illustrations and, yep. and paintings and things like that. Do, do you know where you're going next though? Do you know what your next thing's gonna be? No, I never really do. No. No, you can it's, you've put the pressure on. If it's a book, Meh. The, it's going to be the the choose Bitcoin I, like, Bible. Honestly, like the, this stuff that I write is just like I just write for myself, and that's always you know I'm if I'm proud of it, that's that's enough, and then I'm happy. And then if it's not that popular, like so be it. But uh, you know, well, this one framed a lot for me. It, it gave me a lot more perspective. It, it also reminded me of the kind of low time preference. Mm. This is all playing out as as we right. need it to. This right. stop thinking about price. Stop thinking about use. Just just. Everything is falling into place, and sure, it's 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 a fucking fantastic piece. So I will be saying everyone they've got to read it. So, uh, well, listen, we've we've got to our uh, we've got to our time. I appreciate your time as ever. It's always good for me to have you on the show because it always gets me tens of thousands of downloads. <laughs> I we'll love see. talking to you. Just for people who don't know you, and everyone does, but for anyone who doesn't, tell them where they can find you and follow you and more specifically find this and I will share it in the show notes. I would just say Google my name. The first link is my Twitter account and I've stickied the report onto my profile. So you just go to my profile. It'll be the top tweet that has the link. And it's Tua Demeter T-U-U-R D-E-M-E-E-S-T-E-R Two U's and four E's. There we go. All right, man. Well, listen, always a pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Likewise. Thank you. Okay, so what did you think of that one? Do you enjoy that as much as I did? I do love talking to Tua. I think he's been on the show three times now, and each one has been amazing. And he also, he does write some amazing stuff, but I thought this one was especially good. And I think it's his best piece of writing. I think I actually told him to that in the show. 
I will make sure I leave a link to it in the show notes. So definitely go and check it out. You might want to read it before you get into the interview. And if you do like this one, you should check out my other interviews with Tour. They're all linked in the show notes. And if you've got any feedback on the show, do hit me up. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And if you do want to support the show, if you enjoy listening to What Bitcoin Did, then there is a bunch of things you can do to help. It doesn't matter whether you leave me a review, you share it out with your friends and family, whatever you do, it all helps with the show. It's all up on my website, whatbitcoindid.com. Just click on the support section. And as I said, I'm back in Bedford right now. I'm back for 10 days. Got a whole bunch of shit I need to catch up on. But next week, I'm going to be heading out to Uruguay for Le Bitconf. I'm going to be flying via Buenos Aires, and then I'm hopefully going to be heading out to Bolivia for a couple of days for my other show, Defiant. So hopefully I will get to hang out with some of you out there. As ever, if you've got any questions, do reach out to me. And apart from that, I hope you have a lovely week. 